to know more such amazing stories from Indian history, click the bell icon and subscribe to Live History India. Professor Rajmohan Gandhi is among India's best-known commentators and human rights and reconciliation activists. He published Himmat or Courage, the path-breaking magazine, for nearly 20 years till 1981, and edited the New Indian Express. He has been a parliamentarian, and he is an academician, historian, biographer, and prolific author of more than a dozen books, including modern histories of India, Punjab. Southern India biographies of his paternal and maternal grandfathers Mahatma Gandhi and C Rajagopalachari and a biography of Vallabhbhai Patel Welcome to livehistoryindia.com and its uh, landmark initiative The Making of Modern India and uh, we are delighted to have with us Professor Rajmohan Gandhi Dr Gandhi welcome to uh, livehistoryindia.com welcome again to livehistoryindia.com and uh, may i begin with uh, uh, a, a gentle question is it you know at one of your uh, in in one of your books and in your writing you've often referred to mohandas gandhi as a boatman why did you do that and what what uh, what thought process was behind describing Mohandas Gandhi as a boatman. Uh, could you share some of that? Okay. Sure. Uh, so this phrase, which I picked up uh, and used because I thought it was appropriate, as as a description of of Gandhi, uh, was actually not mine. It was uh, a phrase first used by Chakravarti Rajagopalachari, uh, and it was used at uh, at this controversial Tripuri Congress of nineteen. 19- 39 uh, which was held after subhash bose was elected congress president and uh, other congress leaders uh, uh, felt that uh, that aj subhash bose should uh, uh, follow uh, gandhi's uh, advice and views on uh, how the congress should go forward and how the his working committee should be formed and there was a resolution actually it was moved by govind vallabh pant which required uh, netaji subhash bose to form the working committee according to the wishes of mahatma gandhi and uh, this was passed and it was one of the things that uh, caused uh, netaji to leave the congress uh, at that time and form the forward block mm-hmm. so in the course of his uh, speech uh, on that resolution Uh, Rajaji referred to two boats. There is an old boat uh, being steered by the good boatman, or or by by a wonderful boatman. I think he may not have used the word good boat, but the good boatman perhaps is my word. But the boatman is is Rajgopalachari's phrase, mm-hmm. and he said that's an old boat, and there's a very attractive new boat, which is being steered <laughs> by Subhash Bose. but all of us know that the old boat is reliable <laughs> and, and, <laughs> and he was then referring to the river narmada next to which this congress session was held he said this is a very deep river and we need an experienced seasoned boatman and uh, it's not enough that the new boat should be joined to the old boat all of us must stick to the old boat <laughs> so this is the background <laughs> This is but, but 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 also i think there is a suggestion that the india's journey first towards independence and then towards what to do after independence was a stormy journey through rough waters and the journey required a, a, an astute and seasoned boatman so this was why i gave that adjective to gandhi well coming to the astute boatman sir uh, you know you 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 were Um, 13 years old when uh, Gandhi ji was assassinated. You were in your early teens, I think. Yeah, uh, I was not, not yet 13. I was 12 and a half. Yeah. 12 and a half. Yes. Uh, forgive me, but, but the the point I'm trying to make, sir, is that you know you've seen the freedom movement as a very young boy. Uh, you've seen Gandhi ji 
uh, as an icon, as already an icon from the time of your consciousness. You've seen, uh, and, and when, you know, what, what, when did your awareness of Mohandas Gandhi as a man and Mohandas Gandhi as an icon, if you will, come to you? When were you made aware of it? I mean, this, these grand things that were happening in India and around you, around your family as it were, and swirling around your family and swirling around India. When did you, when were you made aware of it? Or when did your Gandhi consciousness, as it were, grow for you? Uh, I would say that uh, the growth began in a powerful way uh, around this time when, when Gandhi was in Delhi. Uh, between 1946 and 1948, he was frequently in Delhi and for long spells in Delhi. And this is when he was going from 76 to 78 and I was going from 10 to 12. So it was during this time when I saw a good deal of him. Uh, I saw also how uh, he was uh, you know, confronted by uh, sometimes uh, angry Hindus and sometimes by sad and even angry Muslims. I was a boy, but I was observing that these groups of people from different parts of Delhi were coming to meet him and all wanting him to do something. Uh, uh, holding him responsible and expecting that he could solve their problems. Uh, but also, I think a very big event was his fast in Delhi in January, some days before he was killed. And uh, now, uh, although we, his grandchildren didn't have the chance to spend long one-on-one -on -one occasions with him, uh, we did see a fair amount of him, and he was exceedingly affectionate to his grandchildren. So I absolutely loved him. Uh, he seemed to love me and I also loved him. So when he was on this fast, uh, this last fast, which began on January 13, 1948, it was, it was an indefinite fast, he said, it ended eventually on the 18th, on the sixth day of the fast. Uh, but towards the end of the fast, I became quite worried this old man whom I loved very much and who seemed quite an unusual man was about to perhaps die. But it's just strange uh, at that particular moment when this happened, I was playing a ping pong game, table tennis mm -hmm. game with a neighbor. The neighbor had a table on uh, a family's veranda and we were playing this. And while I was inwardly anxious about my grandfather's fate, a strange feeling came over me that, wait a second, this is going to be all right. He is going to recover. And that he would actually end his fast. And within half a day or a day, he did end his fast. So, uh, and although I was too young at that stage to notice uh, what impact if any, the fast had uh, in Delhi. And later on, of course, much later I discovered that it did have quite a considerable impact. But <clears throat> the fact that he fasted, the fact that uh, people urged him to break the fast and that he seemed to have this kind of impact on all kinds of Indians uh, did uh, suggest to me that he was an exceptional character. So when you, I mean, later on in, in, in life, as you, as you evolve and uh, you, you embarked on your journey as, a, as an adult, as an academician, you uh, naturally got to found out more, find out more about your grandfather and the circumstances that led to his departure from India, arrival in India, his activity in politics and, and, and social life of India. Swaraj, uh, the battles, all sorts of things. And then you speak of him very, very affectionately as a doting grandfather. In that sense, I mean, looking at it from that point of view, and also you're a, you're, you're a empathetic biographer to not just uh, the, your two grandparents, but also several other people. But here I, I, I want to bring in the aspect of how 
clinical, clinically, were you able to deconstruct uh, Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi, the man, from Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi, the grandparent, and uh, who, and came, the person who came to be called the father of the Indian nation? Now, the, it's it's. Could you? Uh, I mean, could you share with us, like your like you had uh, a little while ago, about your uh, what you shared about when you were very young? Could you share a little bit with us about how you deconstructed Mahatma Gandhi, as India knows him and the world knows him, to fit the pages of a book as a relatable individual, as a as as, as an extraordinary man, but a man nevertheless? Could you share a little bit about uh, that discovery and that aspect of uh, your uh, of your interaction with Mohandas Gandhi? I'll try. I'll try. You know, it's not always easy for somebody to analyze oneself or to write, uh, uh, to, to give some kind of historical journey of one's intellectual independence or whatever. But anyway, uh, uh, first of all, I would like to say that uh, my aim, uh, of course, the Gandhi biography was something I wrote uh, sort of towards the end, uh, not towards it, but not at the beginning of my uh, my, my writing of scholarly uh, efforts. I did several other books uh, before I ventured into the Gandhi biography. But Gandhi was always an important character. You know, I, I studied Jinnah, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, as closely as I could. I was interested in the question of partition, why it happened, why it could not be averted. But Jinnah was obviously a very important. So I studied him. I studied several other fascinating Muslim leaders. Uh, but Gandhi was a factor in all, all their stories. Similarly, in the very first book I wrote was, uh, was uh, about Rajaji. Shortly after he died, somebody said to me that I should write his biography. That was the first time I uh, ventured into this kind of writing. I had been a journalist before, and I remain a journalist. So he was a very important character in um, Raj Gopalachari's life. He was a very important character in Vallabhai Patel's life. So finally, I decided to study Gandhi uh, uh, as, as, as the chief subject of my, of my uh, research. And so, uh, but I had, whether or not I succeeded, you know, for instance, take, take my effort to write about Jinnah and, and other Muslim leaders. So I was aware that Jinnah was uh, somebody who was responsible for India's partition and the partition created such problems for everybody. Uh, so Jinnah was, uh, you might say, somebody who was vi widely viewed as uh, a person who played uh, a very important negative role. So, but I tried when I did my Jinnah research to be as fair, as objective as possible. To begin with, I must admit that even to read books, uh, you might say pro Jinnah books or books that gave the positive side of Jinnah was required an effort on my part. You know, I didn't like to read these books, uh, which showed certain people in favorable light, other people in less favorable light. Uh, so I, but I, I made, as I suppose all academics have to do, I made a conscious decision that, hey, wait a second, I must read all sides. And I must try to understand all sides. So, uh, so the, uh, the effort to be objective and truthful whether successful or not, uh, I, I don't know, but certainly the effort was there in all my other books. So when I came to Gandhi, obviously I had to be. And by this time I had read all kinds of strong criticisms of Gandhi also. Uh, and it was obvious to me, after all, uh, as somebody growing up in independent India, and I could see not only positive side of, uh, of the new India, free India, but also there was a good deal that was not so positive. So mm -hmm. nobody could maintain that uh, Gandhi uh, or the other leaders of the freedom movement were absolutely perfect, that they created something that was phenomenal. So it was obvious that Gandhi was a human being and that he was remarkable, but obviously uh, some things he could not achieve. And so what could have been the reason? So, so a desire, uh, to be truthful and objective, uh, more than a conscious desire to deconstruct Gandhi. But I, I decided to interrogate him at every stage. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That I would, uh, whether it was his autobiography, 
but I would I, I would question at various stages. Why did he write like this? Why did he, what could have been so forth? So anyway, I, I in short to to summarize my uh, uh, my uh, analysis of Gandhi uh, uh, trying to be uh, uh, critical also of him was the result of my wish, my desire to be uh, objective, truthful, fair in whatever I was writing. What did you, uh, when you say that you interrogated uh, Mohandas Gandhi, uh, what aspects did, did you sort of uh, strike you as uh, unusual or surprising or maybe, you know, the human aspect of the man, the, you just mentioned that there were certain things that he wished that he could have fulfilled or you wished that was part of an, I mean, was part of an unfulfilled agenda, which unfortunately could not be completed. Could you share some of these uh, um, matters with us? Because I think the younger uh, uh, viewers and readers of life history in there and the making of modern India would really benefit from this perspective, sir, which is something that they don't get very often. So, um, so as, as I think most people know, Gandhi's aim was not just independence of India, he wanted uh, united India becoming independent. Mm -hmm. he, he was mm -hmm. very unhappy about partition mm -hmm. and he, didn't, he wanted to avert it. And he failed there. So, um, uh, I wanted to understand why that happened. And this is uh, still, it, I, I don't say that anyone can uh, say that these are the six reasons why India was partitioned in the order of descending importance or ascending Indeed. importance, I think. <laughs> but uh, one can have some general uh, understanding or general ideas. So now, <clears throat> see, Gandhi was uh, trying to be, uh, a spokesperson for all Indians. It was a very tough task. Uh, so when you want to represent a whole nation, you begin by representing the part of the nation that you belong to, uh, mm -hmm. or even the geographical location or, or whatever. So, so you're not always starting with a perfect sample uh, of, of the true Indian. You're starting with the people that... So Gandhi was the leader of uh, the Indian National Congress, uh, which, which at that time did represent large portions of India, or a large percentage of India, but not all of India, even, even at the height of the strength of the Indian National Congress. There were many people who were either not aware of it or were critical of it or opposed to it. So that, so that is one, you might say, uh, uh, limitation. So Gandhi, in his desire to be uh, to represent everybody, well, he represented the Indian National Congress. Now, the Indian National Congress also was largely a Hindu organization. I, I'm you know, young people today who think of uh, the Congress as a appeaser of Muslims or whatever, 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 uh, who have been hearing that kind of line, uh, do not, may not remember or may not know unless they do some history that uh, yes, uh, the Congress although it had many important Muslims in it, it was very pr predominantly a Hindu organization, uh, especially uh, in uh, uh, Punjab and, and Bengal, the two very crucial uh, parts which got divided during partition. Uh, one weakness of the Congress was that it remained largely a Hindu organization and it could not quite uh, win over the Muslims of Punjab or I'm speaking in a broad sense, all the Muslims of what once was United Bengal. Uh, so, so now Gandhi, Gandhi has to carry Congress with him, uh, but he also has to uh, fight for uh, the success of Congress. He, he wants Congress to succeed in the negotiations. So he's not completely, the, so, so when the negotiations in 45, 46, 47 take place, uh, Gandhi is in two minds. He, he wants to be an outsider and bring the Congress and the League and the British together. But he's also the, the, a guide, he's not officially anything in the Congress, but he's still regarded as the leader. So, uh, 
he has to be speak for the Congress, but he has to also be an Indian. So this was, you might say, a, a, a contradiction. You might, and, and because Gandhi, deep down, uh, there's absolutely no doubt to anybody who studies him that he he wants to create something that is good for all the people of India, for the Muslims and the Hindus, for what became Pakistan, what became Bangladesh, and for what remained as India. He and yet he was. Uh, you might say, limited by his uh, attachment to his lifelong commitment to uh, the Indian National Congress. Indeed. Uh, so there's one, uh, one thing I wanted to, I was very curious about uh, your thoughts. Uh, people talk about Mahatma Gandhi, Mohandas, Karamchan Gandhi, but there is very much discussion about Kasturba Gandhi. Um, yeah. You know, who uh, from Mahatma Gandhi's own uh, expositions and uh, those close around him appear to be that he held her in immense stead. And that she, so, but there is a certain uh, lack of understanding or lack of knowledge among uh, hundreds of millions of Indians, I think, uh, of the present day uh, and over several generations as to Kasturba's role in, in Mohandas Karamchan Gandhi's life. Uh, the the impulses that she uh, had on him, the, the the strength that she drew from him, and the other way around, uh, the the kind of were they a team really? Uh, I mean, could you could you share uh, some insights? Because very few people seem to 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 have any any working knowledge whatsoever about uh, the this 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 fabulous person who stood by. Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi for much of his life? Well, that's a great question. And uh, so whatever uh, impressions I have, I will, I will share. At one level, the two were not a, an equal members of a team. Uh, Gandhi was highly educated. Kasturba was not. And one of his, uh, Gandhi's uh, both disappointments and failures, uh, he, he, he himself writes about it, that he could not inspire or persuade or encourage her to pursue uh, an intellectual effort to become highly educated, literate in, in, in that sense. So, uh, so in many ways, uh, there were others uh, in the Indian freedom movement, including other women, women who were highly educated and uh, who could discuss laws and, and uh, discussions in the British House of Commons uh, uh, and so forth with, with him the way Kasturba could not. So, so there was a lack of uh, that kind of equality at, 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 throughout. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, and in, in fact, it's, uh, you know, that Kasturba Gandhi died in uh, detention while Gandhi was with him. She died in his arms. Uh, and it was a very important time in, in the lives of both of them. And there were interesting conversations uh, uh, which uh, some people have recorded uh, between Kasturba and Gandhi during that two years of uh, uh, imprisonment together. <clears throat> and uh, which also reveal, uh, Kasturba at one stage says, why I told you don't, don't take on the British like this. It's very difficult. You've created problems for all of us <laughs> and for yourself. <laughs> Uh, uh, so, you know, that is the kind of uh, only one aspect of it. But having said that, at another level, and I would say at a deeper level, at a more relevant level, Kasturba was of tremendous support to Gandhi. Uh, she gave him uh, uh, the, uh, the, the backing, uh, uh, the emotional support uh, very much that he needed. And there's one incident that some people are aware of, but more, should, more people should be aware of, which was utterly crucial. This was in the early part of 1919, when uh, Gandhi was uh, not very well, and uh, he had taken some kind of vow that he was not going to drink milk. And this is interesting because he, this vow he had taken as a result of many things, including in Kolkata, he had seen uh, how uh, uh, cows were not very well treated by the, those who claimed that they were lovers of the cow. And anyway, so 
Gandhi, uh, for both for health reasons, medical reasons, and for this uh, to do with his uh, feeling for, for the cow, he felt that he would not drink milk, cow's milk. Drink, he would not drink milk, that was his decision. So he is unwell early in 1919, and he has this uh, vow that he will not drink milk, and doctors say that you can only survive by taking, taking milk. And so Gandhi is completely at a loss. That is when Kasturba says to him, when you took that vow, you had the cow in mind, did you not? Did you say that you would not take goat's milk? No, you didn't say that. So you can take goat's milk and still keep your vow. So, uh, and Gandhi accepted that logic. Now that logic may or may not su survive the scrutiny of everyone, but nonetheless, Kasturba's brilliant intervention not only saved Gandhi's life, of course, from 1919, thereafter till 1948, he, he only took goat's, goat's milk whenever he did take milk. But not only did Gandhi survive, he then, that led to the uh, uh, struggle against the Rowlett Act soon thereafter, and then the non-cooperation movement soon thereafter, these huge movements, all made possible by Kasturba's intervention that goat's milk would give him the nutrition and enable him to at least stick to the letter of the vow. So that is one example of what Gandhi owed to his wife and what in, in India owed to Kasturba Gandhi. That, that seems sir, like a Mahabharat scale of intervention. Uh, in, like, like, like a sort of a corollary of Ashwatthama, Hatha, Iti, Gaja. Yes, it is. Sort it is. Of, so, yeah, sort kind of, of uh, yeah. <laughs> yes, very much so, very much so. Is, is there some other aspects of Kasturba sir, that, that struck you as particularly interesting? I mean, after all, uh, I mean, you, you, you would interrogate her as a person as well, even if not for a book, but for your own understanding of your heritage, of your personal heritage. Yes, I, but I, I have to confess that I, I should I should have devoted more time to this than, than I have managed to do. Of course, she was very, very fond of her children, her sons. She had no daughters, uh, she had four sons. And she was present, as far as I know, at the birth of almost all her grandchildren, including uh, me. Uh, so... I don't have a memory of it, but I am reliably informed that she was present when my mother uh, gave birth to me. And uh, uh, so uh, uh, she was very, very uh, deeply devoted, of course, and my father too was very, very deeply devoted to, to his mother. Uh, then I'm also aware uh, through my research, uh, I wasn't aware of it as a child, but in later life, of her own satyagrahas and part of the freedom movement. Of course, in South Africa, she went to prison. And in fact, uh, this is something that is generally not recognized, but the story of Kasturba's struggle in South Africa and the suffering that she voluntarily accepted and her, their eldest son, Harilal, also was in prison. And I think one or two of the other sons also were in prison as young boys in, in South Africa. And that, the fact that not only, of course, the news of what Gandhi was doing in South Africa did uh, reach many parts of India in the uh, late 19th century in the first decade of the 20th century. But uh, when the news also of Kasturba's uh, suffering and sacrifice featured, that also uh, actually played quite a large part in evoking interest in this man and his family. And, so, and of course, then he, she was, uh, took part in other prominent satyagrahas uh, in India too, um, including in Gujarat and Rajkot. Um, then there were these quite well recorded, uh, uh, you might say disagreements, Kasturba went uh, to a temple in uh, Orissa, uh, uh, which was only, which did not ad admit uh, the 
so-called untouchables or Harijans as they were called, Dalits as they're now called. And when Gandhi came to know of it, he was horrified and he issued a public rebuke to her and also to Mahadev Desai who was present uh, at the time. And he felt that Mahadev Desai should have uh, uh, intervened and not allowed Kasturba to, to go to this uh, temple from which the so-called untouchables were barred. So uh, these, there were these, uh, uh, you might say disputes, but uh, as, as you I think indicated in your, uh, before, while you were asking a question that Gandhi was always uh, uh, after Kasturba's death also referring to the role that she had played. And he said again and again that um, uh, and recorded that uh, he, could, he could not have done what he did without her, that she was absolutely utterly crucial to what he did. So on this note, uh, I mean, if you could uh, share a few thoughts about, you know, the, the fascinating thing is that when you discuss history in the present day, a, a lot of people uh, swim with myths and realities of, or, or their own constructs or whatever they've been, whatever they've read, or uh, whitewashed or saffron washed or through a national mandate of history writing, whatever you may want to call it. But there are all these, these myths and realities about famous people, about pivotal people, key people in, in the making of a nation or even the unmaking of a nation. Now, in that, uh, it, from, from that perspective, if you could please come to this uh, sort of the, the troika, as it were, of the Gandhi Nehru Patel troika, of which much is made and much is unmade, that uh, you know, Mr. Gandhi was uh, you know, favored Mr. Nehru over Mr. Patel. Is it true? Is it not true? You know, there are various, various interpretations depending on who's telling the story or who's writing the history. Uh, and propaganda is made of it, a po a sort of uh, political writing is made of it, various kinds of histories are written of it uh, in textbooks and universities and so on and so forth. Could you uh, indulge, please, sir, in a little bit of myth, myth breaking for us uh, on this score as to this relationship between these three pivotal people uh, in in this freedom movement and thereafter to a great extent? Sure. So first of all, I would say that anyone who really wants to know my views on this subject properly should read my biography of Vallabhai Patel, where this issue is, is discussed. And I've also discussed it in some of my other books in, in, in considerable detail. Indeed. So uh, in addition to whatever I will now say, any genuinely interested person, uh, if she or he has time, should go to uh, some of my books also. So in short, uh, there were very sharp differences between uh, Patel and Nehru at time, as often there were between Nehru and Gandhi and between Patel and Gandhi. These three people didn't always agree on everything. But it is also absolutely true that until his death in December of 1950, uh, Labai Patel, uh, was an absolutely loyal teammate and comrade, Deputy Prime Minister to Jawaharlal Nehru. And there's a very uh, clear statement by him, more than one statement by him. Uh, this is after Gandhi's death, where Patel said that uh, Gandhi's judgment on this matter was absolutely correct, that it was the right choice that Jawaharlal should be the Prime Minister. And uh, he said this categorically. Now, Patel, like all human beings, uh, was, uh, had weaknesses. But hypocrisy in speech was not one of his weaknesses. He never said what he did not mean. Sometimes he did say, uh, one of the uh, British army officers at the time relates that Patel said something to him, it had to do with Kashmir and told him something. And he said, don't, don't quote me afterwards. If you quote me, I will say that, no, I did not say it, but I'm saying this to you. Patel was a candid man. Nobody can say that when Patel said that Gandhi's judgment about Nehru was correct, that Patel was being untrue to himself. Patel for one thought that Nehru being prime minister and him, Patel supporting him was the right arrangement. Now, not only was this Patel's view, it's very important to note that it was the view of much of India at the time and for many years thereafter. 
the other thing also worth noting is that in terms of age, Patel was 14 years older than Giovanni Allegri. 14 years is a, is a, is a, at, at, when you're getting old and, and at that time, for, the 14 year difference is a very big difference. And also he was in poor health. In, in his imprisonment, he, he almost died. And Patel was in the final three years of his life and he did some amazing things as the Deputy Prime Minister, Home Minister, Minister for the Princely States. He did extraordinary things, but these extraordinary things were done by an ill man, in some ways a man who knew he was dying. So the age difference in health also was a very important factor. But the most important factor is that Gandhi's feeling that Patel, that Nehru would, was the right choice as Prime Minister was the feeling of the vast majority of Indians at the time. It wasn't Gandhi's preference alone. It wasn't Patel's preference also. It was the preponderant view of Indians at the time. Now, supposing uh, there were many people at the time who felt that this was quite unfair, that Patel should have been prime minister, not Nehru, you would expect that at least some newspapers in some corner of India in 47 would say, why is Patel not prime minister? In Gujarat, you would find some people saying, not one. So those who say that Gandhi imposed Nehru on an unwilling Congress and an unwilling India are really not speaking uh, of reality. Uh, so uh, there, there is absolutely no evidence. And, and many people who wanted Patel to be the Congress president shortly before this, uh, they said uh, that they wanted Patel to be the Congress president, not because they wanted him to be prime minister. And by the way, we know from history that all this led to India's independence and then soon in uh, the Congress president was asked to uh, sort of head the interim government and therefore, thereafter Nehru became an automatic. So we know the sequence. We know that the prison uh, release led to negotiation, negotiations led to interim government, interim government led to prime ministership. But when the Congress leaders wanted Patel to be uh, the president in uh, summer of 46, they, they didn't know that independence was to come. And they said that they wanted him to be president because he was old and he had only been president once in his life, whereas Jawaharlal Nehru had been two or three times. And so they, they, they wanted to honor him. They wanted to honor his Quit India movement. They did not propose him uh, as a prelude to prime ministership, which wasn't at all uh, uh, something that was expected or known to happen. So, you know, this, this is the reason why we're so delighted that you've joined us uh, to, to talk about the making of modern India, because, you know, you have lived and experienced history that most Indians today have only read about if they're lucky or heard about if they're lucky in a, in a straightforward manner, in an uncolored, unprejudiced manner in the way history ought to be shared, written, shared, recorded, so on and so forth. Now, if you were to share, please, a little more about you know, the, the, the sort of the crux of this project, uh, the, the pivot really is of the making of modern India, are the sort of the seminal events in terms of uh, the key events, the pivots that made modern India, the, the people who worked around these pivots that made modern India. And you've actually lived the decades and, you know, you're, you're actually the sutradhar for the making of modern India in, in, in more ways than one. Could you, could you share some of your thoughts about uh, what you believe are the, the, the pivots, uh, the key moments for the making of modern India, the key events, and perhaps the key people as well to follow through after that? Uh, well, this is, uh, uh, I've not quite, quite thought of it like that. You know, I've not, uh, in, even in my own mind, tried to, to line up the key events. But now that you're asking me, I will try. So, uh, course, one has to go back a bit. 1857 was a very major event. The revolt of 1857 was a, was a very major event. Um, and, you know, uh, it's also worth noting that 
although today we regard that as a very great revolt and rightly so. Uh, but it is also a fact that at that time, uh, the best Indian intellectuals were very critical of the revolt in Kolkata, uh, whether it was Ishwar Chandra Vidya Sagar or uh, even Bankim Chatterjee. Uh, they, they they may have had some private sympathies for, uh, uh, but they were very supportive of uh, of, of uh, the British efforts to suppress the revolt. And they, in, in, across India, of course, Jyotiba Phule, very famous person in Maharashtra, who publicly and openly uh, wanted the revolt to fail. So uh, this too is worth noting that the 1857 revolt. Uh, uh, today it has our admiration and support and we are stirred by it, but it's important to note that many of the most prominent intellectuals of India at that time and for decades thereafter were very critical of, of, of the revolt. But, so anyway, the revolt is important and then the British decide that they will make sure that Hindus and Muslims will never work together again. So that was a very important consequence thereafter. Uh, so then there is the 1909 uh, the separate electorate uh, is granted. And so uh, for some time, uh, really the, the British have succeeded and Indians have cooperated in the British plan. And so there is some kind of Hindu movement and there's some kind of Muslim movement. So, so the parallel Hindu and Muslim movements have begun. In, in, in the opening decades of the 20th century. And that is where the campaign against the Rowlett Act, uh, 1919, uh, and, and, and of course, many uh, were critical of the Rowlett Act all across, but, but Gandhi had this inspired idea of a nationwide satyagraha over it. So he mobilized, uh, he, he, he read uh, the popular uh, sentiment on it and he mobilized nationwide satyagraha on it. And so there was a very great movement and people have often forgotten that the uh, Jallianwala Bagh massacre that occurred was a massacre because there was this popular mass feeling against the Rowlett Act mm -hmm. and that uh, Gandhi was not allow allowed to enter uh, Punjab, enter Lahore or uh, Punjab and these leaders of Punjab uh, Leaders of Amritsar, there's Kichlu was Muslim, and and uh, uh, this Hindu leader was his name is Sat Dr. Satyapal. They were arrested in Amritsar, and so there was this tremendous anger. So the Jallianwala Bagh massacre that everybody knows about, but people have forgotten that it was it was a result of the nationwide agitation against the freedom of speech, which was the central figure of the Rowlett Act. So the Rowlett Act agitation, Jallianwala Bagh massacre, and then. You know, there's a lot of talk these days about how uh, the Khilafat movement, uh, support for the Khilafat movement was such a mistake. Actually, in 1919-1920, when the Muslims of India were extremely upset that uh, European powers, uh, the French and the British, would gain control over the Muslim holy places uh, in uh, 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 Mecca and Medina in Saudi Arabia and Najaf and Karbala in what became Iraq. So there was a very strong feeling among Muslims across in, undivided India. Uh, and they became for the first time very anti-British. So Gandhi, uh, who was also a strategic thinker and he was aware of what, what had happened in the 1909 uh, separate electorate and the Hindus and Muslims moving in different directions. And he said twice that we are now getting a one in a hundred years chance for Hindus and Muslims to work together. And if as Hindus we offer our support to the Muslim feelings on this issue, then there can be a Hindu-Muslim partnership. So, so the, actually that non-cooperation movement sometimes referred to as Khilafat agitation because they, they, Turkey was a very big issue there. 
But nonetheless, it was an amazing landmark movement where many Hindus and Muslims actually came together in a very big, and Subhash Bose joined the movement, every, uh, Lala Lajpat Rai joined the movement, Tilak backed the movement. So the non-cooperation movement, yes, it, afterwards uh, the movement had to be suspended and, uh, and then many Hindus and Muslims again went their different ways, but so many important Muslims stayed Maulana Abul Kalam Azad stayed, Dr. Amy Ansari stayed, Ajmal Khan stayed, Dr. Zakir Hussain stayed, Khan Abdul Ghaffar Khan, and many others. So that non cooperation movement was another very big, big, big landmark. And uh, so, I, and of course, uh, I think the, the salt, people refer to the, speak of the salt satyagraha, of course, very dramatic and so forth. But people, what people don't know is that the Dandi March was paralleled by hundreds and hundreds of similar activities. All like Bengal has saw a huge activity in 1930, 31, 32, all across India. Tremendous, uh, thousands and thousands and thousands of people were in prison. So the, the 30 to 32 uh, movements are also very crucial. Then of course the 42 movement was, Quit India movement was tremendously crucial. So these are some of the landmarks. And so the, the constitution of India, I think is a very important. Yeah element in the milestone. And so uh, we all know that uh, Dr. Ambedkar and the Congress, Dr. Ambedkar and Gandhi had many disputes, uh, strong disputes, acrimonious disputes at times. And yet it is a fact that at the end of 46, uh, beginning of 47, uh, overtures were made and, uh, and then Dr. Ambedkar became a member of the first for India's first Indian cabinet. He, uh, he became chairman of the drafting committee of the for the constitution, and then he piloted the constitution bill through, through the constitutional assembly debates. So, uh, so this was a very remarkable development and by, by no means an inevitable or a predictable development. And uh, Nehru and Patel and Gandhi also played a very important part in that, were responsible for uh, enlisting Dr. Ambedkar. So both the invitation to him and his acceptance of that invitation was a very crucial milestone in India's story. And uh, we all know the constitution that resulted and, and you know, the, the preamble, uh, dignity, liberty, equality, fraternity. So these fundamental values are absolutely, uh, you might say, built into the, uh, uh, to the Indian nation, the Indian state, uh, and, and with all weaknesses and various serious shortcomings for 60 years or so thereafter, really it was, it was, the, no, it was the accepted idea that yes, there are difficulties, we have difficulties over caste, we have difficulties over communities, but we are all Indians and we have to live together and somehow uh, honor these core values. Uh, that uh, experiment later then uh, suffered very successful assaults. And uh, so we are seeing those assaults today, but that, uh, that was a very major milestone in modern India's story. So these sort of assaults that you say that you're seeing today, I mean, after all, uh, the making of modern India is a work in progress or a work in regress, if you want to be a little facetious about it, which I'm being, you are obviously not. <laughs> but what I'm trying to say, sir, is that you know, after India gained independence, there have been landmark events and developments as well, which has built, I mean, it's all accumulated into what we're seeing in 2020, 2021, and we'll continue to see the effects of it for several decades, I imagine, uh, in the future. Could you, uh, have you been able to sort of, uh, in your mind, encapsulate a few of these key post-independence sort of seminal events that continued in this sort of evolutionary process of the making of modern India. I mean, uh, Mr. Gandhi and his colleagues and the whole cumulative movement until, and the various processes uh, the, with the British in, in, in on it or not, the Hindu-Muslim aspect, partition, but after 47, 48, uh, after birth of in, uh, India and Pakistan, and then subsequently Bangladesh, there have been other 
seminal events in the subcontinent and India, of course, in particular, that have driven the evolution of our country. Could you share a few thoughts about that? Because that is also uh, part of the making of modern India. Yes, I, I would say that the linguistic redistribution of states was a very important development. And although uh, it wasn't absolutely flawless and it has certain uh, rough edges to it, uh, but basically to enable uh, the Indian people to approach their government in the language that they speak rather than in some, it was a very great democratic step. And I think it, has, it brought governance uh, closer to the people and brought so I would say they, what happened in 56 across India didn't affect all parts of India in the same way, but it affected some parts of India very fundamentally. Some parts of India already were like that, they were linguistic, uh, where the, the governance of a particular region was taking place in the language of the region. And of course, there were always linguistic minorities in linguistic states, and that, that is a problem. But uh, with all its uh, problems and imperfections, uh, that uh, reorganization in 1956 uh, which then uh, that reorganization again was extended later on in different places, but that was an, an important part. Um, in, in economic terms, uh, I would say that that is, a, is less of a clear story. Uh, the planning commission, the socialistic pattern of society and socialism, and then the, so I think that is that it's not very clear whether we can regard those as, as, as proven effective. Uh, I think they, they, they only disclose the tension that exists in Indian society and the Indian economy. Uh, but um, uh, so I, I, I would say that um, so you can see from the way I'm speaking that I'm not, uh, this is not uh, something that I have figured out in my own mind in clear terms that these are, uh, and as you can also see in, in my own uh, historical work, the focus has been on more on pre-independence India. Indeed, than, indeed, indeed. Than on, on later years, although I've, I've written a bit also uh, on, on those. But I think that uh, we should not underestimate uh, the significance of India consciously trying to be a nation for all mm -hmm. uh, after the 47 uh, experience, which was a very painful experience for the entire subcontinent. And uh, so, and, and I, I've said this also more than once uh, written about it, that independence of India was a significant achievement. But to make India a nation for all after independence was at least as significant an achievement. And it was a commitment broadly shared by the vast majority of the Indian people. And so that uh, is, is a historical development that should be recognized. I don't quite see it as a, as a landmark or a milestone. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So here could we bring in the aspect actually which uh, could be the, the core, you know, way of this conversation in, in the present day, which sort of, uh, in, in, in some ways, it seems like a karmic loop that is closed. And here I'm speaking about the aspect of what I would like to call rekindling Gandhi, uh, or the thoughts of Gandhi, or the actions of Gandhi, or the Gandhian philosophy, whatever that might be. But let me yeah. just put, put it as a core of rekindling Gandhi, because, you know, could you, could you, Please explore this sort of immense legacy, if you will, through this, this thought. Because at a time of great divisiveness in India, and it, it seems to have come a full circle because uh, the sort of Gandhi, Mr. Gandhi's actions, and Mr. Gandhi's dreams, and Mr. Gandhi's aspirations in pre independence India were also uh, sort of greatly affected by the churn of divisiveness or divisiveness in pre independence in the pre-independent subcontinent, as it were. And now we seem to come to a divisive country. And, um, it, it, you know, it's where there's, like before, like uh, 70, 80 years before, 90 years earlier, that there seems to be manufactured divisiveness. So is, is it really a time for rekindling Gandhi? Uh, is it possible at all? 
uh, is it relevant to you? I think when we say rekindling Gandhi, we really mean, I think, even if we may not be aware of it, we really mean rekindling uh, the notions of uh, equality, tolerance, justice, that India belongs, that India belongs to all. Also, there's a notion of uh, willingness to uh, put oneself not forward all the time, but to be unselfish and to think of the community as a whole. So there are many things we associate with Gandhi, but I think it's important uh, to, to recognize that. Now, I think a key element in, in, in the Gandhi uh, agenda, I would say, uh, is not only independence of India, but the independence of the individual Indian. Freedom for India, but also freedom for the individual Indian. Freedom to think, freedom to believe. Uh, so, uh, so here, this is something that is not sufficiently recognized, but is very uh, absolutely core element of the Gandhian agenda. Now, uh, you know when uh, people, some people are aware of the of the naval mutiny of February of nineteen forty six. It's a very important event, although it's important to note, incidentally, that not a single Indian officer of the Royal Navy joined, the ratings joined, but there was not one lieutenant or any, any, any other officer of the Navy, but yet the ratings joined in that, that mutiny, uh, February 46. And this is also a time when, you know, uh, the INA trials had taken place in Netaji Subhash Bose was on many people's minds. And the, the Jai Hind phrase became very strong. So uh, during that naval mutiny, uh, there were some uh, who text, there were workers in the Bombay area who also took, joined in support of the mutiny and there was a strike. And then they were going about the streets of Bombay and compelling people to shout Jai Hind. Shout Jai Hind. So this is what Gandhi writes in February of 1946. In as much as a single person is compelled to shout Jai Hind or any popular slogan, a nail is driven into the coffin of Swaraj in terms of the dumb millions of India. Then, not long thereafter, in 46, 47 and the, the communal troubles, and then Gandhi, this is what he says. This is two months before freedom. Everybody knows that, uh, that Rama was a favorite phrase and a sound and name for Gandhi and he approached the almighty through that, that name. So this is what Gandhi says. If someone comes to me and says, will you or will you not utter Ram Nam? If you do, if you do not, then look at this sword. Then I shall say, I will not utter Ram now at the point of the sword. I will never do so. So this is a very important element of the freedom movement, individual freedom. And he, here, uh, Sudeep, I must also mention, although I will not be immediately relevant to the weakening of the Gandhi, you know, the Tagore's, uh, prayers and songs uh, where the mind is without fear. That, that is as important a document for, uh, for modern India as the preamble of the constitution. It is a very important literary and, and political and ideological document. So, so it really comes back to the rekindling of Gandhi or it uh, comes back to the unfinished agenda, which I mean, which you, you you've written so much about the Gandhian agenda in your own works about uh, uh, Mr. Gandhi Sr. Uh, twice over. Uh, you know, the, the works, the aspects of ethno-nationalism, the aspects of untouchability, the aspects of sort of communal harmony, to put it in a very idealistic manner. And these were things that you yourself have written about uh, many, many times that uh, Mohandas Gandhi was deeply concerned about and espoused uh, almost at the cost of diminishing Swaraj for a while, saying that you know, these are so crucial that you know, or, or Swaraj could take a backseat to some extent, but we need to get these acts together. 
uh, our acts together in these spheres. Otherwise, Swaraj would be completely meaningless. So in a way, uh, I mean, this is reflected in your works and other works as well. But in, in a way, Swaraj in the present context would then logically mean the carrying forward of these unfinished agendas, these sort of pillars of Gandhian thought and action of, of, of in terms of kindling or rekindling Gandhi or the understanding of Gandhi beyond just being on the currency notes of the country and being named as roads in all the cities and towns of India, and even as a, a pair of spectacles in the Swachh Bharat mission to cleanse India of whatever ills that I'm not personally aware of. I mean, what, 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 the pair of spectacles are important. The broom is important. Sweeping India clean, Swachh Bharat is important. But you cannot have Gandhi without Ishwar Allah Terena. Hindu Muslim partnership is absolutely central. And uh, putting the poor person, you know, the famous talisman in Kolkata that Gandhi wrote. When you're in doubt, when the self is too much with you, think of the weakest, the poorest person you've met and how to empower that person. That should be the basis of your decision. So those are critical to rekindling Gandhi. But here I would also like to add, I mentioned uh, Tagore, I mentioned uh, Kos Gandhi, but then you know, Nehru and Patel we mentioned, but Subhash Bose, Maulana Azad, uh, Dr. Ambedkar, all these people, all these people absolutely agreed that India was an India for everybody. India was not an India for Hindus only, India for everybody. So it is that India is for all and that the independence of the individual Indian is as important as the independence sovereignty of India as a nation. These are absolutely indispensable essential elements of uh, the agenda for the present and for the future. Uh, and and uh, so uh, I, I think there, has, there can be no doubt on it. Uh, how to get people of different backgrounds, uh, different languages, different religions, different castes to work together, come together. I think this is another very crucial aspect. Really, uh, you know, again, this is a thought I've expressed numberless times, but I think it's perhaps a valid thought that we have our opinions in India, but we don't have knowledge about fellow Indians. We have opinions about fellow Indians. We don't have knowledge about fellow Indians. So whether it's, we, we, you know, we think of Assam and the Northeast with so many groups and so many, we very deep and very understandable emotions, but how well do we know one another? So whether it's by tribe or by caste or by religion, uh, our knowledge of fellow Indians, and of course it's also true of, of the world as well, our knowledge of fellow citizens of the world uh, is insufficient. We have strong opinions, we don't have enough knowledge. So getting to know our neighbors, getting to read their histories, to read their stories, to read their literature, if possible to learn their language, those are some of the steps that the young historians and all of you will encourage and you will, God willing, see in your lifetime. So you encourage uh, Dr. Gandhi, uh, little Bharat Darshan in the footsteps of Mohandas Gandhi. And Certainly. That seems to be the takeaway. Yeah, absolutely, Bharat Darshan. And I would go beyond that and I would say Asia Darshan, Vishwa Darshan. Uh, certainly not the Vishwa Guru nonsense, but Vishwa Bandhu, yes brothers and sisters to the world, uh, 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 learners of the world, viewers of the world, listeners to the world, listeners to one another. I would certainly encourage that. So that's a wonderful way, I, I think, to, to, to uh, unfortunately conclude this conversation, but I, I'm sure that we'll continue in more ways than one through the, uh, as long as the making of modern India continues. Professor Gandhi, thank you so very much for taking the time out from your busy schedule at the University of Urbana Champaign. Uh, Professor Gandhi joins us from the United States of America. Uh, we're very, very thankful to you, sir, to take your time out and to be with us and to share your thoughts. Thank you very much.
Professor. Well, thank you and thank you and your associates. All the very best.